Hi, my name's Kevin. I am the Hungry Outlaw, so welcome to the Hungry Outlaw. Today we're in Cleveland, Ohio, and we are at Trentina, Chef Jonathan Sawyer's newest creation. For those of you that don't know much about Jonathan Sawyer, he is a James Beard award-winning chef uh, that was the best chef in the Great Lakes region. His new restaurant, Trentina, was just voted as the best new restaurant in America by Bon Appetit magazine. And then on top of that, he's recently written a best-selling kids cookbook called Noodle Kids. So we're really excited to have this opportunity to go sit down with Chef Sawyer and, and see what he has to offer. Um, come with me, we're gonna go inside, we're gonna grab some lunch, and uh, we're gonna get to know Chef a little bit. So let's go. And you're sweet. You definitely find some uh, unique but amazingly delicious ingredients. Like I'll tell you, yesterday at Noodle Cat, the steamed buns with the bacon. Yeah, the, the double braised bacon. Oh my lord. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't know what to do with myself. When it's I a crowd pleaser, right? I just figured everyone loves bacon, and then uh, Goob and I chatted about this DJ that we love who raises mostly lamb, some pigs too. Yeah. Um, he does his bacon and summer sauce that we love. We just yeah. took it and just like anything, take an ingredient that we can find and source, put it through the mind's eye of, you know, whatever, noodle cat, cantina, greenhouse, and everything. Yeah. Because that bacon could be in all three restaurants at one point in time. Yeah. But each one will be slightly different depending on the shop. <laughs> so, um, do we start or are we still fun? Oh, we're, we're, we're kind of starting informally. Cool. We're just oh, yeah. uh, so, uh, okay, I swear, my love, you can, that? absolutely you can. I mean, I won't like force it, I won't be like, listen, I'm going to ask my questions. Yeah, good, please do. That's why. So, that leads me to my first question. Perfect. Where, how the fuck do you come up with this? Like, where does this stuff come from? Right. Shit, I wish I knew. You know, I mean, it's a beast, you just gotta keep eating it. Yeah. You know, I don't know if I can say that the inspiration is this, that, or this, you know, but I know that it comes from collaborating with Brian Goodman for 11 years and yeah. having the opportunity, uh, you know, to have somebody who you work so closely with not be sounding board but being a sounding megaphone. Yeah. You know, like I'm like, right, we're over the tavern in a year. He moved here from New York, over the tavern okay. he never lived in Cleveland. Okay. Right now, we just worked together for Charlie Palmer, and he worked for Danny Meyer, and he worked for me when I opened this Okay. That's right. But I was like, you know, we gotta, we gotta do this table thing. You know, we gotta take we gotta take this mundane ingredient and make it special. And that's how you sort of the, the, the avalanche after that was like, alright, we'll treat it like that. We'll, we'll cure it, we'll call it fiat, we'll air dry it, we'll get a nice pellet on the outside of it, simple layer, and then the following day we'll fry it. And then we'll, you know, like yeah. the idea is just start going back and forth. And, and that's just yeah. one, you know, that's just one thing. Like, so just kind of layering it. Right, and having somebody who's not going to be like, all right, let's eat chicken wings. You know, like someone who's going to come at you with bad ideas and good ideas. Yeah. Someone who's going to hear your bad ideas and good ideas yeah. and just keep going. Yeah. Um, and I think that's how we build the whole group. You know, I like to surround myself with people that are smarter than I am, you know, in certain areas. Like Jeremy knows Jeremy knows fermentation and wild foods more than anything. Well, I read the It was awesome. Yeah. So I found this wild apple tree. A uh, really cool thing about wild apples, especially in this area, yeah. a lot of them are the remnants of old orchards dating back to sometimes in some cases late 1700s, yeah. very late 1700s. Yeah. Um, and at that time, uh, John Chapman was alive in the early 1800s. He was Johnny Appleseed. He was based okay. in, in the Ohio River Valley and did a lot of work out of Cincinnati. Yeah. And people would be coming through on the Ohio Area Canal on the Ohio River, and as they were going westward, he had these immense apple orchards all over southern Indiana, southern Ohio, West Virginia. Yeah. And he would travel up and down the river and sell seedlings to the settlers going as they were going west. Yeah. And part of the reason for this was water wasn't safe. But okay. cider was because the alcohol actually yeah. pasteurized the water. Oh, oh, okay. Even low right. levels of alcohol. So that's what people drank. Okay. You know, and, and we hadn't established large wheat fields yet to grow beer or grow barley to grow beer yet. Yeah. So cider was the drink of America. Uh, so people got really invented with grafting apples. So they had a stock tree, right? And that was your, your main trunk. And then let's say they had a, a variety of apple that they liked a yeah. lot. They'd take a branch from that and put it on the stock tree. And sometimes they would do that in three or four different trees. So this wild apple tree I found, you can see these are three distinct different apples yeah. all found on the same tree. That someone, who knows how long ago, 100 years ago, 120 years ago, yeah. grafted three different types of apples to one tree. And I found them all wild in the same spot. And they all have three different textures, three different flavor profiles. Yeah. 
really, really cool. The whole time all I had was horse story. I was like, well, I've been horse samples. And he was like, back in 1886 when John Henry was, you know, <laughs> sailing down to the Cuyahoga, I mean, wasn't called the Cuyahoga yet, right? <laughs> Jeez. But, but that's the kind of shit they love. You know, surrounding yourself with really passionate people. Yeah. And our belief is that we can, we can teach you the rest. If you yeah. have a great attitude, yeah. if you got a good work ethic, if you're yeah. passionate, yeah. the rest is great. I don't yeah. care what this, you know, resume yeah. says. Yeah. I don't give a fuck yeah. what you work for. Yeah. I care about what you are when you're yeah. in our building. And that's all I really have. Yeah. You know? And you continuously produce this top-notch, amazing stuff that has earned you uh, some amazing accolades, especially this last year. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, I mean, that's a, I think a sign of the best people advice to like, take all the compliments, take all the criticism, yeah. read it once, and then just run away. Yeah. But otherwise, you'll fall at the bottom where you're going to hop you are, otherwise you'll plateau and be like, oh, fuck, we want to change through, or we're done. You know, like that. Yeah. It's just an opportunity for us to help people that we're heading on right now. Right. Well, 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 not, I don't know. mean the uh, an apex for us. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely not. Oh, I mean, really like, like, That's like the Heisen Trophy for a chef. If not even more. I mean, right. it's, it's the best we could ever accomplish. Yeah. You know, when I when my when I dropped out of engineering school at the University of Dayton to be a chef, my mom bought me three things. One was uh, membership at the Slow Foods. Okay. One was membership to the Shakespeare Foundation. And the last was a wooden cutting board from Boost and uh, a knife from Boost. I think it's just yeah. a Boost off knife. And she was like, "Well, you're on your own with the tuition, but I think you'll, I think you're gonna do good." Yeah. You know. So, so it was just, it was just, you know, loving being reared in, in the classes of, uh, you know, all those, you know, Richard Olney, uh, you know, uh, um, Julia Child, all those people I love. But right. I do great thing because it is such a devoted by peers. Yeah. You know, it's not. Whipping both through the PR firm to make sure that you win the popularity contest and the restaurant closes the next year. This is people who've been in the industry their entire life saying you're good. Well, I think like, one of the things that you do that I think is really incredible is how you really pride yourself in focusing on locally sourced ingredients. Why is that so important? Well, I mean, our belief is that uh, the only truly sustainable economy is one that's based on local ground. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, the more dollar that we spend in our backyard, the bigger the farms can be, the more stable our jobs can be, the more, you know, name the boring things after that. Tax yeah. revenue, houses, farms, people, roads. You know, that stuff all comes to mind. Yeah. You know, the, with the advent of refrigerated trucks and, and big ag in America and monocropping, we really lost sight of what really mattered. I mean, and I think that. Texas and, and, and Ohio really share the same thing. You know? And forgive me if I don't include Texas in the South. It's right. its own thing altogether. Oh, yeah. They, we, we, they still think they're their own country. Of course. <laughs> but, but I think that it must be had this frugality thing that we've never lost, even during Big A. Even yeah. during 50s TV dinners, even during yeah. the 60s, you know, mono crap. Even during that, we've never lost sight of. You know, we came here with nothing and we barely had anything, but somehow, magically, my great grandma or my grandma Wetzel or my mom could figure out a way to feed 20 people at the top. Yeah. You know, it was 31 first cousins. My mom had 10 brothers and sisters. My grandmother Wetzel had seven. My great grandma Naomi had six. My great grandma Naomi was the one who came through the Brown Fells. And so okay. eventually the Minster and then all the way up to Which makes lights. a lot of sense because it's a very German yeah. area. Exactly. And same with Minster in Ohio. It's just, you know, it's sort of like Chicago was with Polish people. Yeah. You know, they're, just, they're just these hugs they happen. Yeah. People get the word out. Um, but I think that's something that is really special and I wanted to adhere to my restaurants. Yeah. You know? And, and also like a part of that is purposely making mistakes and that's a different that's a different conversation. But it all goes to the narrative that it is Team Sawyer. You know, yeah. like I want I want all the money to go into our backyard. Yeah. You know what I mean? I want and we have seen now that we're talking about between my time with Mike and my time with our group, um, we've seen farmers grow from one restaurant account to 35 restaurant accounts from frozen, you know, not even cryovac, just wax paper covered pieces of meat to industrial cryobacker, full temple branded humane kill facility, yeah. USDA certification, can sell all the way up to the level of brown state. Yeah. So that's one that's really exciting. You can see the success not, on, not only of your restaurants, which is, you know, Important in order to stay alive, but you know your former cooks and your farmers. That's when you're. Yeah. That's really the magic of success. Yeah, and it's why have you decided to just keep everything here and never branch out, which I think is fantastic. Right. Well, I think the simple answer is that I really like my kids. Yeah. Right at the end of the day, after it's ten, we have seven. Yeah. If I open a restaurant in Vegas, if I said yes to that restaurant in Chicago, yeah. if I said yes to that opportunity in Miami, I wouldn't be with them. Yeah. And that and that's not interesting. Yeah. I'm not in this 
in this kitchen in these buildings because I want to be a billionaire yeah. or a millionaire or anything. Right. I'm doing what I love. Yep. And the number one thing that I love is my family. Yeah. So I cook and pride for my family. I happen to love cooking as well. But at the end of the day, if I had to make a choice, it would be kids and wife and dogs and yeah. chickens and guinea pigs. It would not yeah. be stove and poulet and, you know, uh, foie gras. It wouldn't be yeah. that. That would not be the choice I would make. But yet that hence led you to writing an amazing cookbook for cooking with your kids. Right, exactly. Like, how did that come about? I mean, that's just an honest interpretation of our home kitchen. Yeah. You know, like, I didn't say to, you know, Brian Gubin and Jeremy and, you know, all my chefs, like, hey, give me the recipes for the rest of the recipe book. Yeah. It was, what do I do when I'm at home with my kids and I want to engage them beyond the level of turn off the iPad, tell me how your day was. Because yeah. that, that's not the family that we are at all. Yeah. Not that I'm anti-technology or anti-TV or anything. Yeah. But I find the conversations I have with my kids are very honest because we engage them in the kitchen, in the dining room, over board games. And yeah. you know, we happen to go to drive and movies and watch TV too. Yeah. We're not, you know, yeah. well, I guess we are kind of crazy. But we're not really crazy people. You know, we're not blue right. You know, like, right. but I just thought that the approach is is becoming not just like popular, but also people are seeing results. Yeah. Right? You know, like with Brooklyn of America now, like the opportunity to pickle your own things and yeah. do all that. I think that extends into the home kitchen, into the families. Yeah. Not just into like the hipsters and the and the boutiques and the fleas and yeah. all that stuff. Um, so what we wanted to do was say, this is how we come home with our kids. Well, you're teaching your kids to eat the right things. That's, not that's true. Stuff. We're not fucking tricking them, yeah. right? You know, right. and that's my biggest beef too with society, the way it used to be, the way it is now. That it was about getting them to eat vegetables at all costs in the past. Yeah. And that, that like forceful, um, you know, parenting doesn't work. I mean, as you know, if I were to tell my son to go pick up your clothes right now, there's no chance. Yeah. But if there's an opportunity to be ask him about why his bedroom is dirty, yeah. he might pick up his clothes. But if I tell him, do no way. Same thing with broccoli. I'm like, eat that broccoli before you leave the dinner table. Forget about it. Yeah. He'll be there like mommy dares for right. three days, just staring at that broccoli. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Um, so we found that the best opportunity is to, take, is to, is to get them involved in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Right? And I think that there's great studies now that go on about sensory uh, and, and how it parlays into what you eat, right? You're like, if you touch the vegetable, if you smell the vegetable, if you cure the vegetables, even if you're not going to eat it at that opportunity, at that meal, and that's the hard part about parents, it's, it's, you're running a marathon, you're not running a sprint, even yeah. if they don't eat the broccoli that time, the next time they're going to have a friend to eat that broccoli. Yeah. So, so yeah. We've, even, we've evolved to a place where it's like, how do you even, I don't even need to tell them about vegetables anymore. I just go into the grocery store or the farmer's market or the farm I'm going to and I just say, pick up two vegetables for your lunch this week, pick up one fruit. Yeah. And between the between the two of them and me and Amelia, we have eight different vegetables and four different fruits. Yeah. And there we go. And that's it. And there and sometimes they'll just be like, ah, I don't like to lose vegetable. Yeah, whatever. I don't you know, it doesn't matter. You already picked out yours too. There you go. Yeah. In fact I live in Texas, I am true to the bone in Cleveland. And a die hard, as hard as it may be, Cleveland sports fan. Correct. How do you I mean you are in Cleveland Brown Stadium with Street Freaks. Yeah. And I believe you're in, are you in the queue? We're in the Quicken Loans Arena yeah. with uh, uh, Seesaw Pretzel. That's right. And then we also have Sausage and Peppers at the Brown Stadium. So we have four at Brown Stadium and two at the Cavs. Yeah. And we're planning one more at the Quicken Loans Arena, but it won't be for another probably year or so. Yeah. You know. How are you able to watch the game? Right? <laughs> That's what my wife always jokes, that the, the stadium deals are about me being able to go to every sporting event in Cleveland as opposed to actually expanding the brand. You know? That would be my ulterior motive. Oh, right. Um, and there's the game tonight. I'm taking Catcher to the game. Right. Honestly, Catcher is one of the few skill sets that he has in our restaurants, you know, because mm -hmm. they've been in the restaurants ever since they were in the baby bureau in six months old. Yeah. Uh, but at Sausage and Peppers, he tastes every sausage yeah. every time. So we go every time, we taste one of every item every yeah. day. Yeah. And, the, and at the Brown, that's a tiring, you know, I mean, that's, you know, fried chicken, chicken, fried chicken sandwich, yeah. a whole bucket of fried chicken, three different pieces of bread, pickle, chicken sandwich, yeah. three different sausages, all in there, and three more of the plate, kill with the chicken piles. Yeah. Palm freeze. Fritos, which are Fritos that we make ourselves. And there's about 32 items that we taste. Yeah. So he tastes the sausages, and I can't taste everything every time. But he tastes the sausages every time. Okay. Every single one from the fan. And he's got an opinion on it, and, he, and he's vocal. He's honest. He's honest. He's brutally honest. Like your brother. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, so yeah. easy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Abandon me all that. I didn't make it. I'm not offended, buddy, but people are right there. They can hear you. <laughs> right? Yeah. So uh, what's next? What do you got going? Um. What's next for us? I don't know. We want to write some more books. We want to. I think we're ready to write a serious book. 
So we're pitching two books right now, um, one based on all the fermentation and vinegar that we do. Uh, sort, of, sort of in the vein of Noodle Kids where it's, yeah. you know, mad, lighthearted, tons of graphics, tons of how-to. So it'd be like the anthropology of vinegar, um, how you use it in, you know, the bar, in cocktails, in sauce work, in marinades, yeah. um, even as household goods, yeah. different things that we do. Um, and so that's one sort of yes. thing, maybe 80 recipes, not crazy. And then we do, we have started writing our culinary autobiography. So okay. all the way back to, you know, my mom's kitchen and walking out the garden, grabbing a cucumber and a tomato and whole wheat toast yeah. and that situation, all the way to where we are today. So, um, you know, I don't know if it's going to be a pony or not, but it's, it's just one of those books that we wanted to make sure we had time. Well, listen, now that I'm starting this website, I will proudly promote any book that you put out. Nice. I mean, I, we'll be buying them ourselves, so. But, uh, you know, I, I definitely want to thank you for your time. My last question to you is, uh, how do we get you to open up in Texas? you got roots in New Braunfels. I do love so that. means, you know, make it a vacation spot for you and the family. I agree. Listen, I, I have a very near and dear place in my heart for San Antonio and Dallas and New Braunfels. Yeah. I don't have anything against Houston or Austin, yeah. but when I was growing up, my dad did tons of business. As, as, yep. you know, I chatted about forever, yep. he did tons of business in San Antonio. I've done a bunch of speaking in Dallas, yeah. um, so I would love to move there. Yeah. But just like with the kids, i got to get to a place where I can still spend the exact yeah. same amount of time with my kids, if not more, if we're going to expand. So that means yeah. ops here have to tighten up even further, you know, yeah. and my kids have to be a little bit older and be able to travel. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's actually where we are right now. You know, yeah. last two weeks ago at Alex's Lemonade Stand in Chicago where we raised $750,000 for children's cancer care. Wow. Catcher came with me, cooked at the table with me. Two weeks from, three weeks from now, it's Cincinnati Food Wine Fest, Catcher and I are doing a demo out of the Noodle Kids book. We're making gnocchi, we're curling ricotta cheese, and then uh, we're gonna make it all on stage in 30 minutes. So Catcher's gonna so, be the next Food Network star. So. I don't, you know, my expectation for him is just the, you know, it was the opposite of my expectation yeah, right. my parents had for me. Is I just want him to find yeah. something he's passionate about and do it. Yeah. If it happens to be food, great. If not, I don't care. Yeah. You know, if it's the Zydophone, right. He's a Zydophone player. You know? Yeah. Is that even an instrument? Zydeco? I don't even know. Well, I mean, Susan plays, Plone, you play a Xylophone and play Zydeco music with you it. You can put it together. Fantastic. He's made up a new instrument. Get a wasp or, you yeah. know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but honestly, that's my goal as a parent. It's just, yeah. I want him to find something they're passionate about, and then mm -hmm. after that, you know, the success will come. Well, it's, you know, it's obvious, you know, from, from following you for years that, you know, you're, you're an amazing parent raising your kids the right way, teaching them the right ways to eat. Uh, you're bringing the city that I love and putting it on the map for people to see. So from that standpoint, I appreciate everything that you do. And, uh, you know, for uh, me with starting Hungry Outlaw, I couldn't be more honored than to be able to sit down with you as my first person to feature because there would be nobody else that I would want to feature first than you. And it goes back to just the things that you do and that you bring to the community. And so um, with that, I just want to uh, shake your hand, say thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to uh, all your future endeavors. Thanks.